Missing readiness, uh, leaders, military leaders for kids. That's what it's all about. I think, as Susan said, we got started, uh, uh, they were started in 2008. I was only enlisted about, oh, maybe six months ago to, to uh, join this group of military retired personnel, most of whom are admirals and generals, well over 100 now. And they include people like Shelly Cashavili, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and, and uh, Hugh Shelton, who equally was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and, and uh, uh, Wes Clark, who was a candidate for president, and also a, a senior uh, Army official. We have two Marines in this organization, me and one other, a woman named Carol Mutter from Indianapolis. And Carol, by the way, was the first woman to be selected for three stars in the military services. And quite an accomplishment and feat, I think you'd all, all agree. The point is, we're all, we've come together in, in essence because we believe in American youth. We can't but look at a picture of Iraq or, or Afghanistan or any place else in the world, but you see a young American soldier or sailor or Marine dealing with a kid, talking to a kid. Well, that's a reality not only with those young people, but it's with the olders as well. We, we feel for young children and young children who are affected by the ravages of war and conflict. There's no question about that. And in this country, we have, we have concerns. We have major concerns of a national security uh, a venue, if you will, because as we look out to the future, to the year 2000, for example, 2030, if you look at 2030, what you really have to do is take a look back at where we are today with, with, K, uh, with the pre-K education. We've heard from the speakers so far today that what happens is if these kids don't get that break, if they don't get that education through a Head Start program or something like Head Start, they're, they're going to be disadvantaged, and they're going to be disadvantaged through their entire uh, life cycle. And that's unfortunate. That very few people can pull up their socks uh, after they've started uh, basically behind the pack. And that's what we're confronted with. So, so we've come together in, in, with, to confront this problem. Now, oftentimes in the service you think of these technical problems. And that's reality. We have airplanes, we have drones, we have sophisticated listening devices, we have sensors, we have all manner of technical things. But today's young men and women can cope with that. Today, we, each service, every one of them, makes their numbers in recruiting. They also make their numbers in re-enlistments. People who are in the service, many of them decide to stay. Others don't, of course, but, but the re-enlistment numbers are being made. Now, they're being made from a number that's quite interesting. I want to tell you, and I, maybe, maybe you've heard this number before, but today, American men and women who are between the ages of 17 and 24, 17 and 24, men and women, boys and girls, if you will, at the younger ones, they are ineligible to serve in the United States military. Imagine that 75% of the kids who are walking around cannot meet the test of military, for military service. Now, how do they break down? Well, they break down in three capacities. Rich has talked about uh, the, uh, criminal records. There is a significant number, one in 10, the numbers I, I hear nationally, kids having a criminal record of either a felony or a major misdemeanor. They can't join. There are kids who don't have a high school diploma. We've talked about that here today to some extent. They can't join also. And then finally, we have the physical disabilities issue that, once again, is a disqualifier. Physical disabilities of the sort that one might have in a birth defect, but one might have achieved in an athletic injury of some sort, but most particularly because of obesity. They can't get in. 33% of New York kids cannot join the armed forces because they are obese. That's also true, 32% is the number for national, uh, the national number. So New York is right there with everybody else, it uh, would appear. Now, when you think about that, how many, how many young people in that category can't, not only the obesity, but the other, all the categories combined, cannot join the service? 
Well, actually, in New York, it's 1,750,000 youngsters are not eligible to join the armed forces. That's pretty pathetic. I mean, and it's frightening. And to me, it's a shocking number. Now, there are some waivers that are granted for exceptional circumstances. I understand that. But those are the raw numbers. Now, I want, to, I want to say something right now. My wife and I live in Bath, Maine. Bath, Maine is the city of ships where all destroyers, of oh, many of the destroyers, are constructed for the U.S. Navy. People come up to me and say, Bob, Bob, have you lived your entire life in Maine? And of course I say, not yet. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you're listening. <laughs> well, take that 25%. Just imagine yourself that your daughter or your son was a United States Marine sitting in the cockpit of a F-18 sitting on the deck of an aircraft carrier. And she's about, or he's about to be catapulted into the air. Now, she looks down on the deck, and, and there on the deck is a 19-year-old kid who salutes, and he salutes, and she returns the salute. Now, that kid has got to maintain that airplane. He has to make sure it's mission capable. He's 19 years old, but he can read a technical manual. He can go to page 120, 179, 129, and find out what's wrong with the fire control system. That's today's kid. That's today's kid. But what about tomorrow? What happens tomorrow when the economy improves, when technology advances like leaps and bounds? And who is going to fill these national security requirements? Certainly all of you who are in business, I know you're going to want the people who can deal responsibly with the tasks that you ask of them. They can be people who will complete a task when they're given it. They're the kind of people who have integrity and they're responsible. Those are the people who you want in the business community and we want in the service. So there's going to be a competition. And if we don't do something about expanding the number from 25% to something greater, national security in the judgment of 100 plus uh, uh, senior officers uh, will in fact come to pass. We'll have troubles on our hands big time. We'll have to either reduce standards, which is the only thing we can do, and reduce capability. And that doesn't harbor well for national security. 